Preface of The Critique of Dogmatic Theology and Investigation of the Christian Teaching. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Critique of Dogmatic Theology and Investigation of the Christian Teaching by Leo Tolstoy. Translated by Leo Wiener, 1862 to 1939. Preface. I was inevitably led to the investigation of the doctrine of the faith of the Orthodox Church. In the communion with the Orthodox Church, I had found salvation from despair. I was firmly convinced that in this doctrine lay the only truth, but many, very many, manifestations of this doctrine, which were contrary to those fundamental concepts which I had about God and His law, compelled me to turn to the study of the doctrine itself. I did not then assume that the doctrine was false. I was afraid of supposing that. For one untruth in that doctrine destroyed the whole doctrine, and that I should lose the main support which I had found in the Church as a carrier of truth as the source of knowledge of the meaning of life which I was trying to find in faith. So I began to study the books which expounded the orthodox doctrine. In all those works, the doctrine, in spite of the diversity of details and some difference in consecutiveness, is one and the same. So too, the connection between the parts and the fundamental principle is one and the same. I read and studied those books, and here is the feeling which I have carried away from that study. If I had not been led by life to the inevitable necessity of faith, if I had not seen that this faith formed the foundation of the life of all men, if this feeling shattered by life had not been strengthened anew in my heart, if the foundation of my faith had been only confidence, if there were within me only the faith of which theology speaks, taught to believe, I, after reading these books, not only would have turned into an atheist, but should have been the most malignant enemy of every faith, because I found in these doctrines not only nonsense, but the conscious lie of men who had chosen the faith as a means of obtaining certain ends. The reading of these books has cost me a terrible labor not so much on account of the effort which I was making in order to understand the connection between the expressions, the one which the people who wrote them saw, as on account of the inner strength which I had to carry on all the time with myself in order, as I read these books, to abstain from indignation. I used up a great deal of paper, analyzing word after word, at first the symbol of faith, then Philaret's catechism, then the epistle of the Eastern Patriarchs, then Macari's introduction to theology, and then his dogmatic theology. A serious scientific tone, such as these books, particularly the new ones like Macari's Theology are written in, was impossible during the analysis of these books. It was impossible to condemn or reject the ideas expressed, because it was impossible to catch a single clearly expressed idea. The more I got ready to take hold of an idea in order to pass judgment upon it, it slipped away from me, because it was purposely expressed obscurely, and I involuntarily returned to the analysis of the expression of the idea itself, when it appeared that there was no definite idea. The words had not a meaning which they generally have in language, but a special one, the definition of which was not tangible. The definition or elucidation of a thought, if there was any, was always in a reverse sense. To define or clear up a difficult word, use was made of a word or series of words entirely incomprehensible. For a long time I wavered in doubt, did not permit myself to deny what I did not understand, and with all the forces of mind and soul tried to understand that teaching in the same way as those who understood it said they believed in it and demanded others too should believe in it. This was more difficult for me the more detailed and quasi-scientific the exposition was. When I read the symbol of faith in Church Slavic, and its word-for-word -word translation from the obscure Greek text, I managed somehow to combine my conceptions of faith. But when I read the Epistle of the Eastern Patriarchs, who expressed those dogmas more in detail, I was unable to combine my conceptions of faith, and was almost unable to make out what was being meant by the words which I read. With reading the Catechism, this disagreement and lack of comprehension increased. When I read the theology, at first Damascans and then Macari's, my lack of comprehension and my disagreement reached its farthest limits. But at last I began to understand the external connection which united these words, and the train of thoughts which guided the writer, and the reason why I could not agree to them. I worked over it for a long time, and finally reached the point where I knew theology like a good seminarist, and I am able, following the trend of the thoughts which have guided the authors, to explain the foundation of everything the connection between the separate dogmas, the meanings of these connections of every dogma, and above all, I am able to explain why such and not another connection, strange as it is, was chosen. When I attained to that, I was shocked. I saw that all that doctrine was an artificial code, composed from the mere external, most inexact terms, of the expressions of the beliefs of a great variety of men, discordant amongst themselves and mutually contradictory. I saw that harmonization was of no use to anyone, that no one could ever believe all that doctrine and never did, and that therefore there must be some external purpose in the impossible combination of these various doctrines into one and in promulgating them as the truth. I even comprehended that purpose. I understood why this doctrine was sure to produce atheists in the seminaries where it is taught, and I understood the strange feeling which I experienced when reading these books. I had read the so-called blasphemous works of Voltaire and Hume, 
but never had I experienced such an undoubted conviction of the full faithlessness of a man as what I experienced in reference to the composers of the catechisms and the theologies. When you read in these works the quotations from the apostles and the so-called fathers of the church, of which the theology is composed, you see that these are expressions of believing men. You hear the voice of their heart, in spite of the awkwardness, crudity, and at time falseness of their expressions. But when you read the words of the compiler, it becomes clear to you that the compiler did not care at all for the sincere meaning of the expression quoted by him. He does not even try to comprehend it. All he needs is a casual word, in order to attach by means of it an idea of the apostle to an expression of Moses or of a new father of the church. All he wants is to form such a code as will make it appear that everything which is written in the so-called Holy Scriptures and in the fathers of the church was written only in order to prove the symbol of faith. And so I came at last to see that all that doctrine, the one in which I then thought the faith of the masses was expressed, was not only a lie, but also a deception, which had taken form through the ages and had a definite base purpose. Here is that doctrine. I expound it according to the symbol of faith, the epistle of the Eastern Patriarchs, Philarets' Catechism, and mainly, Macari's Dogmatic Theology, the book which the Church regards as the best dogmatic theology. End of preface.